It is good to see you. And uh, we were going to run a video, a wonderful video. Uh, I was not able to get up. We've had terrible technical difficulties this morning. But you know what? That has nothing to do with the Lord and, uh, and the power of God's Word. So we're going to have a great time today. But uh, by way of announcement, next week we'll be doing the Christmas box campaign. And so we, I just wanted to make you aware of that. And we will have an incredible video and testimony coming up probably next week now that you'll want to make sure to, to be here and see. Uh, but I want to just welcome everybody. Are you having a good morning? Yeah. Amen. Good. Well, welcome to HBF and good morning. If you are a first-time guest to HBF, we are glad that you are with us this morning. We want to bring you a gift, a little gift bag. It has some Tootsie Rolls and some information in it, as well as, a, as a, a little Bible, which is one of the gifts that we give to you. Anybody here, first-time guest to HBF, thank you for coming. Just uh, thank you for being here, guys. So we've got a couple in the front row and some over there. And uh, if you are, like, afraid to put your hand up, I get that, you know. If you brought a friend, maybe you can raise your hand on their behalf and they can bring it to you. But we're glad that you're here. Inside of those white guest bags are also, is also a white connections card is what we call it. And uh, if you could fill that out and at the end of the service uh, drop that in the offering plate, that'd be an awesome gift back to us. And we'd love to get that information and, and uh, send you a note thanking you for being here this morning. As I always invite people on Facebook, I don't think we're Facebook live in today, but those that are watching on video, we're glad that you're watching, and uh, we definitely want to uh, welcome you back, and hopefully you come back and visit us in person as soon as possible. And so if you have your Bibles, be turning to the book of Acts chapter 8. We're going to continue our study in the book of Acts. We've been talking about a few faithful men, how God took a few faithful men, right, and, and literally just revolutionized uh, the world, the whole culture of Europe was altered, um, that area of the Middle East in Israel, Syria. Uh, as we saw last week, we started talking about the influence of the gospel going beyond Jerusalem, beyond Judea, beyond Samaria, to an Ethiopian eunuch, and now Africa is being touched with the gospel. We'll continue to talk about that this morning as you're turning to the book of Acts chapter 8. And uh, this morning, as we continue this study, we talked about last week divine appointments, right? Divine appointments, dynamic divine appointments is what we're visiting about or talking about this morning. How many of you this week actually had a divine appointment? Anybody? All right. Well, praise the Lord. Awesome. Uh, anybody got five seconds you want to share what happened? Is that too much? All right. Come on. James, come up and... All right. Share it. Go ahead. Uh huh. I asked her just straight up Friday. Amen. Well, praise the Lord, man. Praise God. <clears throat> now, if you've been coming on Wednesday night, what has Jeremy Bonas been doing? He's been preparing us to take advantage of divine appointments. And so, uh, by the way, we just ended that study on, uh, on evangelism, and we'll be beginning a study in Daniel. And so you'll want to be here for that as well. Jeff Trude will be teaching that. It's going to be a great study as well. So we should be looking for divine appointments. But uh, we're not going to be sensitive to those if we're not sensitive to what the Spirit of God is doing in our own life. And so I appreciate those testimonies and those hands raised, and that's exciting. And this is an exciting chapter because God is fulfilling through Philip what, is, what he has promised to the apostles in the book of Acts. Isn't it awesome when God uh, fulfills what he has promised? It's awesome. You just want to praise the Lord and, and rejoice. But you know what's interesting is there's a lot of work to do. We don't see Philip uh, resting on his, uh, on his uh, haunches right after going to Samaria and reflecting and going, man, that was really a great revival at Samaria. Next thing you know, he's talking to a eunuch. And we'll see by the end of the text that after that, he's off doing more business for the Lord and he's going forward. And it is important that we're diligent because the Lord's return is going to be is any day, any moment. We need to be ready in heart, but we also need to be fervent in the work that we're doing. So we're ready at his return. And so I want to just take the text in Acts chapter 8 and go back over and read the end of this, uh, this uh, chapter as we look at this account of the Ethiopian eunuch. And if you have your Bibles, let's start in verse 26. And uh, in honor of the word, let's stand again. Uh, sorry for you that have your laps all set up. 
And uh, you never know when I'm going to pull the stand up and read the Bible. But uh, it's important. The Word of God is, is holy and it's precious. And let's look into the Word of God. Acts chapter 8 in verse 26. The Bible says in verse 26, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, under the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, and eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot. And he read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb dumb before his shear, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet of this? Of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus and as they went on their way, they came into a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went both down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch. And he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the spear of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at uh, Azotus, or Azotus, I should say, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Heavenly Father, we come to your throne this morning. We just thank you for Jesus. What an incredible gift we have in Christ. Lord, there's nothing else greater than you. We thank you for the praise that's been offered up, Lord. It's a sacrifice of praise, Lord, and we know that it, in the throne of heaven right now, the angels are singing, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Lord, we are so uh, enthralled by who you are, and Lord, we are uh, just incredibly uh, excited about the fact that you use us to accomplish your mission and your purpose right here on earth. Lord, we're so thankful that like Philip, you want to use us to dispatch us, or like the Ethiopian eunuch, you have a message for us from the Word of God that will completely alter our lives and the lives of those who you send us to. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for taking note of us and dying on the cross for our sins, sending your Son Jesus to be our payment for sin, resurrecting on the third day according to the Scripture. And Lord, you're alive right now at the right hand of God, and we are here in Christ's stead, reconciling men to God for your honor and for your glory, for your namesake. I pray you to quicken the word of God this morning in our hearts. And Lord, help us to, to go forth from this message today, inspired, encouraged, empowered, Lord, to accomplish your mission and your power for your glory. We thank you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. All right, so I want to do a little review as you're being seated and getting your lap readjusted. Um, just kind of remind you of what we saw last week. Because last week, uh, we got into this, this, uh, the text already, and I kind of pulled up, and uh, I decided to just uh, park it so that the children's workers could go home before 1 o'clock, and you guys could see the Chiefs game. So I heard the Chiefs game's at 7 o'clock or something tonight. Is that true? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's okay. We'll get you out of here for lunch. But you know, in Acts chapter 28, verses 26 through 30, we, we started off last week talking about the need to go. And uh, we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit further about that, but it, just by way of review, you remember in verse 26 of, of this chapter, it says, in Saul, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm in chapter 9, in verse 26 of this chapter 8, it says, and the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, arise and go, right, toward the south. Go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And so we saw that Philip went obediently. He didn't hem haw around. He didn't mess around. And we need to go obediently. Why? Because God says so. And of course, we brought up Matthew chapter 28. If you're born again this morning, you are commanded to go. It's not an option. If you say, oh, I'm a Christian, a lot of everybody likes to say they're a Christian. But let's just see in our lives, are we going? Right? Part of being a Christian 
is going with the gospel. You say, well, I'm not a gifted evangelist like Stan Plew. Well, guess what? It doesn't matter, right? Some of y'all are gifted evangelists. But even if you're not a gifted evangelist, you're called to go and share your faith. And I know we want to do friendship evangelism and all of that, and that's, that's actually very important, and we should do that. But there still comes that point, right, where you actually got to put your, your name on the line and open your mouth and actually speak Christ and let them know you are one of those fanatics that actually believes the Bible, that actually believes Jesus is alive, that he died on the cross, he was buried, and that their soul's in the balance. And they really need to understand this gospel message. Well, that separates the men from the boys. And it, and it also separates those who proclaim to be Christians and those who actually have fruit of it. Because going is what we do. Now, that's last week's message, so I don't want to preach that again. But that's what we do, right? We go because, well, God tells us to go. Go ye therefore. Teach all nations. <clears throat> Make disciples, right? And so making disciples is beyond just sharing the gospel. We're also to go and, and teach others also the things that we've been entrusted, right? The church is stewarded with mysteries. We have seven mysteries. So you can take most of the doctrine of the New Testament <clears throat> and break it down into seven Mysteries, which, by the way, when you blow up those mysteries, they, they, they fill up the house, right? They are, they're very deep in meaning, but most of the New Testament wraps around those mysteries that we're entrusted with. So we have those mysteries, right? So when we go through discipleship, a lot of what we, are, we teach in the mysteries is, is touched on in those 16 discipleship lessons, whether you know it or not. And so we're entrusted with that. And then we teach that to others also. Why? Because we're, we're committed to being faithful. We got to go and teach others also. And then you notice that he went immediately in verse 27. And, but, but again, I got to get out of chapter 9 and chapter 8. And he arose and went and behold a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasure and had come up, up to Jerusalem for to worship. And so he immediately arose and went. We see that as well. And then we saw in verses 27 through 30 that he went expectantly. The text there says, And behold, a man of Ethiopia. And he went and he expected to meet the man because God told him to go on a mission. But as I pointed out last week, it was kind of a progressive revelation. He was on a need-to-know basis, just like a soldier, right? A soldier needs to know what they need to know. Like, hurry up and wait right? And then you're going to be dispatched here. No, we changed our mind. You're going to be dispatched there. And you go where you're told to go and you do what you're told to do. Why? Because you're a soldier. Philip didn't say, well, God, I'll go to, I'm going to go down to Gaza as long as you give me the backstory. Tell me everything that's going to happen before I go so I can, you know, pack my suitcase accordingly. God's like, Philip, go. Philip went. And then he saw a man. Ah, oh, that must be who I'm looking for. And he joins himself to that chariot, expecting God to do what God does, which is get the gospel where it needs to go on time. And so I, I ended last week on that point. We, we, we will never know. <laughs> this is what's crazy. You'll never know if you don't go. The older I'm getting, the more I realize how important it is to seize the opportunities that are in front of you. Tonight, I, I get the privilege of going down to Bethel Baptist in, in Warrensburg and preaching down there at their missions conference. And, and they invited me just to talk about what God's doing with missions, like here. And I'm like, well, in particular with Asia. So I'm like, okay. And so I'm recollecting. I haven't done this. I've never sat back and recollected. What's God been doing in the last decade? Oh my goodness. Since 2008 to 2018, if you start to list all the things that God has done because four guys got on a plane and flew to India to follow their buddy Doug Pearson? It's incredible what God has done through you. I'm not talking, I mean, this church and the relationships that you've had. I mean, church has been planted locally, KCK. Missionaries have gone out. I mean, it it's, it's blows my mind, actually, the more I look at it. What is that about? That's just being obedient and going when God tells you to go. And, and it, sometimes you're so busy going forward, it takes you a moment to look back and go, Wow. Someone needs to write that story down, but who has time, right? We got to keep going. It's amazing, but you'll never know if you don't go. You know, sometimes it's like that. We had a great time this summer in Jamaica. Now, only Sam went with me, so I could say we, had a, we could have had a horrible time. You really wouldn't know. But no, I, we really did. We had a great time in Jamaica. And I tell you what, it was hard to get there. 
I would have never known what a great time it was going to be. I'd have never met Pastor Raphael. I would not have experienced all the things that I saw with our Bibles in the hands of believers if I would have relented. And believe me, there's a few times I almost did. It just wasn't convenient to go. There were so many reasons why I shouldn't have went. But I went anyway. Praise the Lord. And you know what? Sometimes it, I look back on those things now and I'm like, wow, that was a blessing. But if you never go, you'll never know. Think about all the things we miss because we don't go. We don't go there with somebody. And you're thinking, I'm talking about trips and things. But maybe it's not taking a trip overseas. Maybe it's to the cubicle next to you or the, the neighbor across the street or what have you. And you wonder. Well, no, you don't wonder because you never went. You don't really know if you don't go. We get so afraid of rejection, don't we? We're so afraid of failure. You know what? Sometimes you just got to go and risk failure just to see what will happen. Go like, go like the Ethiopian Union or go like Philip and expect God to do something. doesn't mean it will always happen. But even when things don't go your way, God's still working. Because even if you get the door slammed in your face, you know what God's doing? He's working in you. And you walk away from that going, man, Lord, that's what it feels like to be rejected. Man, I'm so sorry I've rejected you. I'm so sorry the way we treat you. And you still grow from that experience because you identify with Christ's sufferings. But you'll never know unless you go. And so this morning, I want to finish our thought on this, this subject of going before I move on to my next one. And I want you to look at the, at the next go statement here. So the book of Acts, chapter 8. Now let's look at verse 29. It says, then the Spirit said unto Philip, here it comes again. Now this is a capital G, go near. Just in case you don't want to, in case you want to gloss over it, the Holy Ghost says, stop, look at this. Go near and join thyself to this chariot. So we need to go obediently, immediately, expectantly, and then we need to go near. So God has another commandment through the Spirit of God to Philip. Go near and join yourself to this chariot. Now, I don't think there was a whole lot of chariots rumbling around out there in Gaza, but in case there was, it's this chariot. Go to this chariot. He was probably traveling with security, by the way. I, I would suspect a guy like the Ethiopian eunuch, he's, he's not just traveling out there in his coop by himself, man. He's got a posse. He's got an entourage because, well, he's somebody and he is a treasurer, right? And so he's probably got some means and some resources. He's been doing business up in Jerusalem as well as worshiping, and so... So Philip likely had to go through a background interrogation, right? Homeland Security had to go through his stuff. and No, he didn't have to do all that. But I'm certain that he had to, to approach the eunuch. He had to probably go through a couple people, at least one person. But people, uh, people will not hear. People will not hear if we don't draw near. If Philip would have just thought of obstacles, he'd have never gotten down there. He'd have never gotten to whoever he had to get through to get to the eunuch. But he saw that and he knew that God was doing something and he went there. And whatever the case is, he drew near so he could share his faith. And that's what we need to do as well. We have to be near people before they'll hear us. Isn't it easier to share your faith? It's easy to share your faith from a pulpit to masses of people and just shooting it out there on the internet. It's a lot harder when you get right down in people's grill, right? Right? And you sit down here and you say, hey, Dale Newkirk, let's have a relationship. Well, man, that takes effort. You've got to get up next to the chariot. But you know what? That's how people really get saved, isn't it? I heard Billy Graham preach. I heard, who's that charismatic guy he used to preach? Jimmy Swaggart? Man, Jimmy Swaggart, he had me crying every week. Right before, right before uh, what is that? All-Star Wrestling, man, when I was a little kid. <laughs> And, and by the way, he had some good gospel messages. No, no joke. God used that stuff. But I didn't get saved, at least in my case. Now, people do get, I know lots of people get saved from, uh, you know, Billy Graham, Mass Evangelism. I've led people to Christ at those events. Praise the Lord for it. Pastor Rogan got saved reading the Bible. Praise the Lord for it. But some of us, right, need a little help. We need someone to draw near our chariot, to sit down with us and say, hey, how's it going? Where are you at? It says, Philip ran thither. Look at, look at verse 30. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, unto, understand thou what thou readest? Now Peter, or Philip, 
He didn't take any time at this. He ran. He saw this man and he ran to him. It was an amazing response. He didn't even jog, right? He ran to him. And when he gets there, he's reading the prophet Isaiah. You know what Paul said? When he got done in 2 Timothy, he says, you know, I've ran a good race, right? I fought a good fight. You know, the, the ministry is somewhat like a race, isn't it? There's times you certainly have to catch your breath, but there's also times we need to be running. There's times we need to be fighting, and it's a struggle. Man, Philip wasn't afraid to run at God's will. We should be enthusiastic, is what I'm trying to say about witnessing. Oh, I gotta go out, take it to the streets. Oh. I gotta go to the harvest party or the fall of Palooza. I might have to talk to somebody. Oh. Now, I know that's how you feel on the inside. But that's why we gotta get right with Jesus, right? That's why we're having a pep rally. You know, before any big game, right? Homecoming, all that stuff. Where they get a big pep rally. Why? Because you can't go out there and fight the battle if you're like, oh, we're going to go out tonight and win. <laughs> go team. No, man, we gotta be we got to be busy about this thing. We've got to know God's going to work. We've got to get to where we need to go with the gospel. We've got to open our mouths and expect God to do something. And you know what? He'll make these divine appointments available. Because we expect God to do what God does. The issue isn't, will God do what God does? The issue is, will we do what we're supposed to do? Will we draw near? And will we do it with enthusiasm? Will we run to those opportunities? Will we see the opportunity? Will we look forward to the waitress? Look out, waitress, here I come. After church on Sunday, I'm fired up. You will hear the gospel today. Before you get it out of your mouth, she says, what must I do to be saved, sir? <laughs> You're like, Whoa! You got to ask the right questions, though. You notice in verse 30 what, the, what, what Philip says. It run, he runs there and he heard. He took the time to, to listen. So I am talking about being enthusiastic, but you do have to have a little bit of cool. Shh. Listen. All right? God's given us two ears and one mouth <laughs> so we can listen. What are they saying? What are they saying? Okay, I'm listening to what they're saying. Oh, and what is he reading? Just a practical note, if you're going to witness to people, pay attention to what they're saying. Pay attention to what they're reading, what they're listening to as well. That'll help you go a long way into being, knowing what to say when it is time to speak the gospel. And then he goes on to say, and he, re he read the prophet Isaiah and said, understand thou what thou readest. You notice he asked good questions. He didn't come up and say, let me tell you what you need to know. He just says, uh, oh man, that's a fine book. What, do you understand what you're reading? Do you think Philip could have explained that right off the bat? What do you think? Yeah. Someone's reading John 3.16. Oh, don't walk up. Oh, everybody knows John 3.16. I memorized that when I was a kid. That's not the right way to approach it. Condescending attitude. It's better to say, hey, John 3.16. What, what does that mean? Because just because you've known it since you was a little kid doesn't mean everybody else knows it. Especially in our culture today. You'd be surprised. Some of you guys over 40, you'd be shocked at what people don't know about the Bible. They've been plugged into whatever they're plugged into since the time they're born. They get their own media stream. It's personalized, and it doesn't include, they don't have to watch the football game anymore and see the guy in the end zone with John 3.16. I think that guy must have passed because I hadn't seen him in a long time. And so they don't even know what that is. The eunuch's reading this going, hmm, Philip, even though he's enthusiastic, and even though he runs to get there, he still pauses and he's listening. Hmm, what's this man reading? And then he asks a very good question. Do you understand what thou readest? And notice the response. And he said, how can I except some man should guide me? <laughs> and he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. 
You notice what he desired. He invited him up. He says, come up on here and sit down with me. Come near. And he drew him even closer. Come and tell me a little bit more about this. So dynamic divine appointments, they start with going, right? They start with going. You gotta, you've got to get to the point where you can be drawn near. You draw near and they draw near to you. God puts it together. And the next thing you know, people are asking you, what does the Bible say? What does this mean? And you know what we got to do? We got to show them. It says he desired that Philip, he would sit up and come up and sit with him. And verse 32 says, the place of the scripture which he read was this, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before his shear, he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or some other man? Now, I love the way that how Philip waited for the invitation, right? He didn't just jump up in the, in the seat with him. Of course, uh, he might have gotten, you know, torn away if he tried that, but uh, the, he was invited up. So, number one, Philip waits for the invitation. He didn't bust the eunuch's door down. He didn't go any further with the conversation than the eunuch was comfortable with. And he left it out there for the eunuch to respond. Conversely, Philip was not bashful about stepping up to sit with the eunuch when he was invited. He understood this was a really good opportunity and he jumped up in the seat with him. And he not only, so Philip waits and then Philip sits. He waits for the right opportunity and then once he receives it, he goes ahead and he sits down with him. You know what that implies in our culture? It takes time. You know what? Something that none of us have a lot of. But if we're really going to win people to Christ, we're going to have to wait for them to invite us to have that conversation, ask good questions, listen to what they're saying, ask the right questions. And when they invite us to speak, you know what we need to do? We need to come on and sit down with them, take some time with them. Listen to what they're reading. Look at the text. And, or of course, in the case of, if they don't have a text, you give them the text and then talk about it. But Philip sits with the eunuch and, he, and, and posture is important. It's implied that this would have been a, a personable, relaxing conversation. Right? It's deliberate and not rushed. When you witness, you know, make time to take time. I know you may be handing out flyers and doing this or that. I've done this before. But what happens when you come to that door and all of a sudden you notice, ding, 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 ding. There's a fish on the hook. Someone has got been prepared before I got here. What do you do? Oh, Thanks. Move on? No, no. You pause. If I put the whole neighborhood on hold, personally, if that one person is ready to hear the gospel, take some time with them. Listen to them. Minister to them. Sit with them. There's nothing more important in the universe than making sure the person God has opened the door has your undivided attention and clear explanation of the gospel. That's why we do altar calls here. This isn't a, you know, gospel gun church where I just want you to make a quick profession. We do altar calls here because we want you to go with somebody and sit down. Not everybody that goes and, and sits down comes away as a born-again Christian. Some do, some don't. But the point is, it's important to sit down and actually look at the Bible. What does the Bible say about sin? What does the Bible say about salvation? What does the Bible say about repentance and salvation and faith in Christ? What's all that about? And what's the Bible say? So that you can make a decision. Because it's very personal. It's between you and the Lord. You got to make the call. So Philip doesn't make assumptions about what the eunuch knows or thinks. He waits for the eunuch to ask the question and allows God to give the answers through him. The Ethiopian uh, was reading uh, Hebrew, by the way, not Greek as many of your... Anyway, I won't get into that. Um... <clears throat> He was reading the Hebrew, so he was a well-educated man. Many think he was reading the Septuagint. I don't believe the Septuagint was even written until probably a couple hundred years later, so that's, that's why I say that. And I do believe being a man that would worship in Jerusalem, he probably did know Hebrew as well. He was very interested in what the Bible said. So he's reading this, and he has a question. Uh, the word of God cannot be discerned by human intellect alone. It must be revealed by the spirit of God. Why? Because the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians, this is the mind, right? This is the mind of God. This is Christ's mind. So the spirit of God teaches us all things whatsoever he has said unto us, John chapter 14. The spirit of God is our teacher, 
but he uses human instrumentation. So Philip doesn't make assumptions. He comes and he listens, he, he waits, and, and he realizes that the word of God needs to be opened up to this man. So Philip shares because he cares. In verse 32, we see uh, the text that we already read, and he reads this passage from Isaiah. And as he's reading it, it's, it's working on him. He's like, who is this speaking to? Who, who is this about? This man or someone else? I could imagine being a eunuch. He's been castrated. He's a man that cannot reproduce. He's no threat to the throne in, in Ethiopia. He's obviously affluent. He's intelligent. He isn't able to have any seed. And yet he reads in this text of a man who dies, and yet his posterity goes on and on and on. Who's he talking about? Himself? Or is he talking about someone else? I believe Philip shares because he cares. The Pharisees in Jerusalem, you know what they would have told him? The Pharisees, the Sadducees in, in, in Jerusalem, they would have said, oh, that prophecy is dealing with Isaiah. It's about Isaiah. But the eunuch, he can tell that's not referring to Isaiah. Because where's, Isaiah, why, where's Isaiah's generation? Who's a, who's a child of Isaiah? It's not like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So I'm sure this man being intelligent, a man, by the way, who knows how to count beans for a living, he's an accountant, <laughs> he's reading the prophecy, he's going, well, if this is about Isaiah, then where's his generations? Maybe this is about somebody else. Now, Isaiah 53 and verse 7 says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted and he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before the shears is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people. Was he stricken? Uh, that's not Isaiah the prophet. A eunuch, was cast, a, a eunuch that had been castrated to be eliminated from the threat of taking on the throne and not bear seed would have been very interested and intrigued about this story. Who is this man? And who is the seed following him? And where are they? Well, he happened to be talking to one, and his name was Philip. Philip. Philip opens his mouth, the Bible says in verse 35, and it says, And Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. I love the way the Bible says he preached unto him Jesus. He opens his mouth and he preaches, and the eunuch believes and receives the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who is that subject matter in that scripture in Isaiah? It's Jesus. And he goes back through and he reads the scripture once more. And it is Jesus, right? It is Jesus that was oppressed. Jesus was afflicted. Jesus opened not his mouth. Jesus was brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before their shears is dumb. So Jesus opened not his mouth. He was taken from the prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? We are. I happen to be here from Jerusalem. I am, I'm one of the deacons in the church and Jesus Christ himself resurrected from the dead. Then he told us to go ye therefore and teach all nations. In Acts chapter one and verse eight, which has not been written yet, he said we will go to Jerusalem, to Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And I'm here today to proclaim his generations because he has now given us a supernatural seed and it is the word of God. Jesus Christ is the word and in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And I'm here to introduce you to him personally because he is alive and he wants you to be born again and he wants that to happen today. Whoa, the eunuch says. I don't know if that's what the Philip said, but that's what I'd have said because <laughs> I just did it. And so he's preaching Jesus and he's laying that thing out, man. He's letting them know, listen to me, this is the man. And yes, he died in Jerusalem. And yes, your Pharisee friends that you've been hanging out with in Jerusalem, some of those priests that have gotten saved and followed that way, they too have recognized that Jesus Christ is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. No man cometh, for, uh, cometh to the Father but by him. And man, he's, he's just filling him up. and whoo, He's receiving the word of God. Because it's true. And he answers his questions. 
He answers his questions. Look at the text. And as they went on their way, they came to a certain water, and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What does hinder me to be baptized? I mean, everybody's getting baptized and receiving the Spirit of God. What's going to hinder me? And Well, notice what it says in verse 37. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. What did he do? He, he confessed with his mouth and believed in his heart. And guess what? He was saved. And he commanded the ch chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Isn't that a wonderful passage? It is. To answer his question, what hinders me to be baptized? The answer to that question, by the way, is removed in your NIV. I, and I'm not going to pick on anybody today that's using one because you probably don't know any different. But the last thing that the devil wants anyone to do is come to faith in Christ. And so what has he always done? He tampers. He tampers with the message. Verse 37 is missing in the NIV. I want to just do a little comparison here. Because in essence, you'd be reading right now, if you had an, another, one of the more modern, quote, modern translations, as he went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went both down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him is exactly what it'll say, or something to that effect in the NIV. Why would that be? If thou believest with all thine heart is missing. He answered and said, is missing. I believe, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, right? John chapter 1 and verse 12. It's missing. The NIV is missing it. The New Living Translation is missing it. Your ESV has a footnote, see below, not in the original manuscripts. Your New American Standard, it has the verse in brackets and then points you down to the footnote that says not in the original manuscripts. Now, all other modern translations in English, if it doesn't completely take it out, will tell you that it's not included in the earliest manuscripts. And I just want you to know right now, that's just not true. That's a lie. There's a couple lies. Number one, there is no original manuscript. You're not going to find it. No more than you're going to find the original book of Jeremiah that got burned in the fire. Or the next uh, edition that got thrown in the middle of Euphrates. Anybody go scuba diving lately? You ain't going to find it. But what we do know is that God preserves his word. Why? Because the Bible itself says God will preserve his word. Every generation, Psalm chapter 12 tells us that. We have the certainty of God's word. Not only that, our King James Bible is compiled of over 5,000 established documents. Syriac, Latin, uh, Greek, of course, and Arabic. And, of course, the Hebrew, Masoretic text. So it's not like there's a little bit of evidence for what you hold in your hands if you're using an authorized version. But the, 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 the whole, not in the original manuscripts refers typically to the Sinaiticus, Greek, and the Vaticanus, both of which are not credible to start with. And if they're not in those, ah, well, they're not in the original manuscripts. Don't mind that in the second century, in Old Italic, you can find two mentions. And externally, you find Irenaeus and um, uh, Cyprian quoting directly 180 A.D. and 250 A.D., exactly what your King James Bible says in verse 37. So you have internal evidence, you have external evidence, you have evidence. So why, then why would scholars, why would people that are so intelligent that they can spend their whole life studying dead languages and be so much smarter than, than me and you tell me that that verse doesn't belong in my Bible? Well, perhaps because they would prefer a different doctrine other than salvation by grace through faith in the finished work of Christ alone. Perhaps they would rather see you get baptized and work your way to heaven. 
Because the devil always wants you to try that avenue. Because when you boil it down, there's only two ways. <laughs> one's God's way, it's grace. And one's the, the, the way we prefer in our flesh, which is to work our way to heaven. And when it comes to salvation, it's by grace through faith and Jesus Christ alone. That's who Philip preached. What was Jesus leaving a distinct impression upon, or what was Philip telling the Ethiopian eunuch? There's one way to salvation, and it is through this sacrifice. He is a lamb led to the slaughter. He is the fulfillment of every Old Testament picture of sacrifice. There's only one sacrifice that's acceptable now to go to heaven, and that is Jesus Christ. He has fulfilled the law. The law wasn't bad, but you know what? Jesus is better, and now we put our faith in him and him alone. Philip was communicating that somehow to the Ethiopian eunuch, and the Ethiopian eunuch got it. He's like, well, then what do I need to do? What hinders me from being baptized? I believe this. He says, just make sure that you believe with your mouth, and he can earn your heart, and he confesses with his mouth, and he's saved. But if you read that in the other manuscripts, supposedly other manuscripts, in what you have, what hinders me to be baptized? Oh, nothing, just go get wet. Forget the heart relationship. Forget the personal relationship with Christ. Forget grace. Let's keep on working and see where that, that puts you. And so that's a good example, by the way, because it's so clear. There's others like 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7, which also is a, is, a, is a verse that's been attacked by that. And I could go on with many more, but that verse as well is going to be monkeyed with, often just skipping over God the Father, the Word, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. There are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, 1 John 5, 7 says. And these three are one. They don't agree in one. I mean, you've got to have a New World Translation to see that. They are one. They are one. Oh, and again, the scholars say, oh, that's not in the original manuscript. For there are three that testify... And then nothing else is in the text. And then you jump on into the earth, earthly witness and forget the heavenly witness of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, the Godhead. Your authorized version, your King James Bible is intellectually honest. When it includes a word, it tells you, it puts it in italics and says, hey, this is what we had to insert to give you the sense. You look at any other new translation, will they tell you what words they've added? <laughs> no. But they'll footnote all the ones they've taken out for the most part. Actually, that's not even true. 1 John 5, 7, they don't footnote that in the ones I was looking at. It's not even footnoted. Oh, by the way, we just removed the Godhead out of your Bible. The heavenly witness. And we skip to the earthly one. Now, I know, I'm just an old Baptist preacher. And this stuff troubles me. And everybody can just go about their business. But listen, beloved, it's my job to preach the word of God. And I've got it. And so I'm not going to back off on that. I'm just going to let you know I'm not mad about it. And I do understand, you know, people have all these reasons why they use other Bibles. But let me tell you, I'm not a King James only person because somebody else says something else or this person says that. The reason I stick to the Bible is because I trust it. I've read it from cover to cover several times over and hey, are there things I don't understand sometimes about it? Absolutely. But you know what? It's absolutely reliable. By faith, I can trust this book. And so when people start tinkering around with your Bible, you better take notice because that's exactly what the devil did with Eve in the garden. If you want to answer, <clears throat> if you want to answer questions, you need to, to know that you have the answers. You don't need to be bringing questions upon questions. What must I do to be saved? Well, I don't know. Let me think about it. There's so many people that postulate on how you could be saved. Some say this and some say that. No, thus saith the Lord God. Believe on the name of the Lord, right? And thou mayest call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Show them in the Bible. Show them the verses. Let them know how they can be saved. So Philip had the answers to the eunuch's questions. And you, may, and you need to know the answers to those questions. When people need to be saved, you ought to know the gospel. By the way, I've led people, just to be balanced here, I have led people to Christ out of a Dewey Reams Catholic Bible, out of an NIV Bible. So I find the gospel in any Bible I got at the time. If I'm in a mission or someone hands me their NIV, I won't do this. I don't take their NIV out of their hands and say, oh, that's garbage. You need to use a King James Bible. I just, be smart. Use your head. Just take what they're reading. Find the gospel and share it with them. The first thing is get them saved, all right? Because there are some wackos out there that don't think you can get saved unless you're reading a King James Bible. 
And so that's crazy. We're not crazy. We're just committed, all right? I might need to be committed, but I'm not crazy. All right. Oh, Brian, you make so much out of nothing. You know what? That's what Eve said. So Philip continued with him to answer his question, to help him with the next steps. It wasn't just about, uh, by the way, I took a little time on this subject because it's missing. It's so obvious I wanted to talk about that. But why did he continue with him? It wasn't just to share the gospel. It was to get him to that point where he was ready to make that commitment. And then it was so beautiful as he went with him. Both of them went down into the water. Another thing, by the way, baptism, though it does deal with identification, every time you see it in the, in the Bible, it's dealing with immersion in the New Testament. And, and that's what it even means, is to be immersed. Immersed, excuse me. And so Philip, he helps him in verse 37 and verse 38. And when they were come up out of the water, in verse 39, the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. This is a great day. Notice here that Philip, by the way, uh, he helps him take his first steps in believer's baptism. Last week, or this would have been believer's baptism day here at HBF. If you need to get baptized, right, you've placed your faith in Christ and his finished work alone, you trusted him as Lord and Savior, you need to take that next step, well, we'll be doing that next month. So get a hold of me. Get a hold of your Bible fellowship pastor. Get a hold of someone who's a member here. We'll get you connected and directed so you can take that first step. But it's important because there's no signs that followed this. Not like you see up to this point. This Ethiopian eunuch, he literally, he reads the Bible. He believes the Bible. He trusts the Lord Jesus Christ. He's baptized. This is the first time you see that happen without anybody speaking in tongues, without anybody raising up and walking, without any other signs and wonders. This man gets saved by grace through faith in the finished work of Christ alone. And you'll start to see that pattern as you continue on through the book of Acts, as the gospel goes out to the Gentile world. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 22, for the Jews require a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. That's what Philip did. He preached Christ crucified. Under the Jews a stumbling block, under the Greeks foolishness. Right, but unto us who are saved, what is it? It's the power of God. It's the power of God into salvation. That's what happened to that eunuch. So Philip assisted his obedience in baptism. Then Philip, he doesn't sprinkle. He immerses. They both went down into the water. Discipleship lesson three. And perhaps today you need to make that decision as well. So here it is. Go, show. And the last thing you need to do is know. And we'll be done. In verse 39, I've already read it. You see that he is caught away and he goes. You know, the Bible says in, in verse 11 of Isaiah 55, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. After they came up out of the water, Philip was caught away. Literally, that word means what we would say today, raptured. He's caught up. He is caught up and he is transported to Azotus, and uh, a day's journey, by the way, to the north. So he is caught up, and he's transported. Now, that somewhat is a sign, I would say. That was amazing. Uh, and so he had, he, it was an amazing thing for this to probably see by the, the, the eunuch, but he doesn't get to see him again. There's no signs, there's no wonders, but there is this incredible impression made upon the eunuch as he sees Philip being whisked away to go to his next assignment. You know, you think Donald Trump's something coming in on a helicopter. They ain't nothing, man. I mean, we get, we're going, we're getting crazy here. Uh, Philip, he preaches, and the next thing you know, it says he's caught up. He's raptured up, and he's gone. And so I have no reason to not take that literally. Uh, if you don't want to, you don't have to. I'm not arguing on that point. But I think he was probably taken up and dropped where the Bible says he was in Azotus. Now, <clears throat> Philip, he can rest. He can rest knowing that the Lord knows those that are his. He's left this man behind, but God must go with him. Now, that's not a, a prescription that we like to prescribe around here. When we lead someone to the Lord, what do we want to do? We want to continue. We want to follow up. We want to disciple. And that's the pattern that you see in the New Testament. But in this case, Philip had more business to do, and, and God was going to take care of the Ethiopian eunuch, I'm sure. But I'm sure Philip also followed up. Let me get your name and email. What's your email address? Right? Let me text you. Right? Let me check in on you. See how you're doing. So that he, even though he was away, I'm sure he was praying and praying that that would be a prosperous life for the eunuch and he would continue to preach the gospel. 
as much as we'd like to stay behind and disciple everybody we lead to Christ, it's not always, it's not always possible. I was amazed one time just a few years ago in, in, a, in, a, in India. I was preaching and had an altar call and a lot of people made professions, you know. I thought that was the way it was every week, actually. So I just thought, okay. And then I came back a couple of years later and, and Pastor Pradeep says, Brian, those are the people that prayed. Those are the people. He goes, they had never, he goes they don't, that doesn't happen every week. Because when they get saved there, they're facing persecution. So getting, that's a big decision. He goes, they're doing good. They've been, they've taken, they say taken baptism. They've taken baptism. I'm like, praise the Lord. It was really encouraging to see that, you know what, even though I was gone, you know what, God continued to work. It had nothing to do with me, right? My job was just to preach the gospel. There's times that God uses you to sow. There's times that God uses you to water. And there's times that God uses you to reap. But I tell you what, we should all be about the business of making sure those that are young in the Lord, those that are new in Christ, get everything they need to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, wherever we may be. If I would not have had a man take me into his home and teach me the word of God and break it down simply, I promise you I wouldn't be up here preaching today. Me being here this morning preaching to you started with the man inviting me to his kitchen table before he even invited me to church because I was more apt to go to his kitchen table than I was ever going to go to church. He met me where I was at and he put me right in the center of God's word. And the word of God does the work. Beloved, if there's anything we cannot get away from in this church, it's taking people and sitting down with them and putting them squarely in the word. If you want the most flashy thing, man, Heartland's not going to be able to give that to you. We're on a tight budget, man. We got as much flash as you're going to see right here, man. That's it, right? And the bulbs will pop if we start flipping them too fast. So you just got to go with it. But what we will do is keep you in the word of God. That's what we're going to do because that's what we're commanded to do. We're commanded to go. We're commanded to show. And we're commanded to know what we're doing with what God has given us and impart it to others. So know God's work must go forward. You know what? That's not the only thing that, that Philip knew. He wasn't just focused on what happened in Samaria. He wasn't just focused on what was going on with Philip or with the Ethiopian eunuch. He knew that God's work had to go forward. In verse 40, check it out. But Philip was found at uh, Azotus and <clears throat> passing through, he preached in some of the cities till he came to Caesarea. No, he was busy. He went to all the cities until he got to Caesarea. He hit every one of those things. Why? Because he was not weary in well-doing. Beloved, this is not the time to lay back on our haunches and get tired and lounge around and wait to Jesus to come get us. When we wait on the Lord, man, what we need to be doing is getting our, our waiter gear on, getting our platters out, and going around serving everybody the gospel that we can. Because time is short. And it won't be long we'll be standing at the judgment seat of Christ, looking back on these days, going, what was I wasting my time on? Philip didn't waste any time. Man, when he was done here, God put him there. You know why God did that with Philip? I really believe. Because Philip would do what he was told. I don't know if he was the most eloquent. I don't know if he's the most personable. I don't think it really matters. I think the thing is that when God said, go, he went. When God said, show him, he showed him. When he says, hey, you know what you do next? Yep, sir, yes, sir. I'm gonna go preach the gospel. Good, you know what to do. He hit every city, and he did. He hit every single one of those. From Ashdod, that's the same city as Ashdod. Azotus is Ashdod preaching in all the cities until he came to Caesarea. He didn't spend time reflecting on the past, but moving forward on the mission, getting the gospel where it needed to go on time. Because God has done many notable things. I was just mentioning some earlier. But you know what? We can't live in the past. There's a lot of notable things. In the last 15 years, God has done 16 years in this church in particular. Amazing. I was just sitting out in the back this week, and I was looking at the property, just praying and I thought, wow, we still have 20 acres and we haven't even tapped the potential. What would God do here? And it's not about, Amy's like, well, Brian, it's not about numbers. You know, that's true to some point, but it kind of is about numbers because if people don't get saved, they're going to fill up hell. And if people don't get discipled, we aren't going to get any forward traction in this culture. So I do tell you, Jesus Christ died for sinners of whom I am chief. <laughs> And it ain't right for me to be saved and not everybody else to be saved. So you know what? We all need to get busy about doing what God has saved us to do because that's why we're here. He's done many notable things, but we got to make sure that we look, we appreciate the past, 
Man, I'm sure Philip was happy about the eunuch. He was happy about Caesarea. He's happy about Jerusalem. But you know what? He was on the next city until he got to Caesarea. So let me ask you this morning, what is, in, what is your next city? Are you ready to go? Are you ready to show? And do you know what you're supposed to do? If not, why not? You're in the right place. We can take the Bible and show you your next right step. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to be in your word this morning. We pray a blessing on the reading.